Welcome to CBN's Week of Prayer. This is the time that we set aside to pray for you and ask you to tell us what you want us to pray for and be specific with your prayer requests. If you want to be a part of this and have your prayer request prayed over by the staff of CBN every day this week, uh, we, we, it's our honor, our privilege to pray with you. So if you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is real simple. You can go to CBN.com. There's a place on the website where you can submit your prayer request. There's also a way where you can just call us, 1-800-700-7000. Or you can write to us, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Uh, if you need prayer in these uncertain times, uh, by all means, let's go to God Almighty with our request. We can go boldly to His throne of, of grace. We know when we pray in accordance with His will, He will hear us and He will answer. Now, in these turbulent times, it's always good to, before you pray, to turn to Scripture. And this morning, I was in Isaiah, it's the ninth chapter, uh, verses six to seven. This is all for all of us who question government and question, you know, what, what's our mayor doing? What's our governor doing? What's our administration doing? What's the president's doing? What the Senate and Congress are doing? What, you know, it, these questions are coming. What's the government doing? And it's always good to go back to scripture and get reassurance. Here it is from Isaiah chapter nine, verses six and seven. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And then it adds, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this which is wonderful. It means it's not up to you and me. We are, we're not in charge of this. The government is on his shoulders. The increase of his government, the increase of his peace is no end. And we don't have to do a thing. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Realize that because of his overwhelming love for you, he went to the cross. He died. He rose again. Right now, he is at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing? He is interceding for you and me. His government, the government is on his shoulders. His government has an everlasting increase. His government has peace. So let's enter into that. It's not something we have to do. It's something he has already done. And when we have that attitude, we're in that position well, then we have plenty of freedom to pray and pray without anxiety, but pray in confidence, knowing we are praying in accordance with his will, his word, his government, his peace. We know when we ask, we will be answered. Now, we've gotten prayer requests. I just want to read a few of them that have come in just yesterday. Here's one healing for my son-in-law after a stroke. He has some brain damage. He's quite childlike now and needs to learn to speak and is confused. Healing for my husband after our open heart surgery, four bypasses were done. His blood pressure is not under control. He's got shortness of breath. He also has diabetes and kidney disease. And another one for kidney disease, praying my kidney would be a match for my son-in-law who needs a transplant. Then uh, for family requests, prayer for protection and peace for children who are homebound and living in an abusive environment. School may have been their only safe place. And then another one, please pray for my son who is deeply depressed because of his failing business. Let's pray for these specifically. I'll pray for these. Uh, we have our CBN staff. They have the other requests. They'll be praying for them. And you join with us. Let's create a great circle of prayer knowing that the government is on his shoulders. He is responsible. He's watching. He's not sleeping. He's not slumbering. He's watching over. And the increase of his government has no end. And the increase of his peace has no end. Let's enter into that. Let's pray. Let's believe. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. And we just declare there is no end to your government 
There is no end to your peace. So, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our hearts, that our hearts would be settled, that you have our future, that you are working all things together for our good, that you have been working all things together for our good, and tomorrow you will be working all things together for our good. You love to do this. You love to watch over us. It is your zeal, your, your everlasting zeal that accomplishes this. So, Lord, give us eyes to see that. Give us ears to hear that. Give us a heart to understand that, that we may enter into your rest and to, into your peace that we would see your glory and how you're accomplishing your purpose on earth today. Give us this revelation, Lord God, and remove from us all fear, all anxiety, but let us have your perfect love and your perfect peace. And now for those who have medical problems, for the one who has had heart bypass surgery, for the one with kidney problems, for the one wondering about kidney transplant, Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. For all those in the audience that need healing, whether it's from COVID-19, whether it's from other diseases, whether they're worried about lack of care, whether they're worried that if they go to a, a doctor or to a hospital, they'll be infected, Lord, provide their need and heal their bodies now. For all those who are struggling at home and struggling in environments that are hostile, Lord, let peace be upon them. Let your peace come to that home. Let, let all anger and all strife and all bitterness and all resentment and all abuse be gone now. In Jesus' name, let the hearts of the fathers turn to their children. Let there be compassion, generosity, forgiveness, and safety, Lord God, in the home. Let homes be safe places, not places of strife and violence. Safety, Lord. Be a prince of peace for them. And let the government of your peace have no end in their houses. Let it not be a momentary truce, but a peace that endures. Now, Lord, for anyone who's having emotional problems right now, for anyone who is anxious, come to them. Let your peace guard their hearts and minds. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you'd like us to pray for you, again, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. You can also write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463, or you can go to our website, cbn.com. There's a place on the website where you can write in your prayer request. Either way, do it now. We're in our week of prayer, and we want to pray for you. Well, we're joined now by a dear friend of CBN, Sheila Walsh inspired viewers of the 700 Club for years, and her sense of humor combined with a contagious love for Christ has made her a popular author and sought-after speaker. She's currently a co-host of Life Today with James and Betty Robeson, and today Sheila joins us to share her personal journey of discovering a powerful prayer life. Hi, and welcome to my living room. Really grateful for the opportunity to just share a few words with you in this special week on the power of prayer. About three years ago, I decided to start researching everything that God's Word had to say about prayer. And not only that, but to go way, way back and look at, like from the early church on, what do some of the early church fathers have to say about prayer? And the reason is this. I, I knew that it was the one area in my spiritual life that I felt the weakest in. I love to study the Word of God. I love to dig deep and find jewels um, when you look at the original language, the Hebrew or the Greek. And I love uh, what an honor it is to stand on a platform and, and share about the love of God and teach from the Word of God. And, and I love to do that on, on television too. But I felt that the one area 
that I really struggled with was the area of prayer. So I never intended to write a book on it. It was simply something that I wanted to do for my own spiritual life. But one night I decided just to kind of see how my community of friends um, and social media, how they viewed prayer and what they might struggle with. So I just threw out a simple, if I say to you, tell me your thoughts on prayer, um, what would those be? And then I said, and and please don't feel as if you have to say the right thing. Just say what you really, really feel or what you think. And some of the answers, you know, I identified with things like, um, I get distracted. I'm halfway through praying and I suddenly think, did I defrost the chicken? Or I feel like I just repeat myself over and over and over again. But some of the some of the responses had much more weight to them. Things like, I prayed that God would spare my marriage. I prayed with tears pouring down my face, God, please heal my marriage. And my husband left me anyway, so why bother praying? And others said things like, if God already knows what he's going to do, then, then why bother praying? So I began to see that it wasn't just um, an area that I felt I struggled in. I began to see that it was something that maybe many of us struggle with. So I, I took two years just to kind of research and pray and dig deep before I, I wrote about prayer. And there were so many things that God taught me personally in the journey because that initially was my only thought. Father, teach me how to pray. Holy Spirit, guide me and show me how to pray. And one of the first things that became so clear to me was that prayer was so important to Jesus. I began to see how often you would read, um, like after a busy day, he would send the disciples home and then Jesus went up the mountain to a quiet place to pray all night. Or he would get up early in the morning and, and, and pray. And, or he would withdraw from the crowd and pray. That made me think if prayer was so important to Jesus, it clearly has to be really important to us too. And then I began to see something that actually John Bunyan summed up beautifully in this quote. He, he wrote, it's better to have a heart with no words than words with no heart. That God is more concerned about or more interested in our presence than our perfection. In fact, it reminded me of something that happened the summer that I turned 18, 943 years ago. I was about to go to seminary, but I wanted to do something to volunteer in my little fishing town on the west coast of Scotland. So I decided that I would volunteer at our senior center. It was a place where all our seniors could come for morning coffee and to have lunch, to have afternoon tea and play some games with friends. And and I absolutely loved it. But there was one gentleman that I could never reach. He wouldn't come to the tables for lunch. And so I had to take his lunch to him on a tray. He would sit against the wall with his back to the wall. And most days I would say, you know, here you are, enjoy your lunch. So nice to see you again. And he wouldn't respond at all. So one day I thought, I have to get more creative. So after I brought his lunch to him on a tray, I then um, took another chair over and I sat beside him. And I said, hi, my name is Sheila. And I was born in this little town. But I said, but one day I'm going to go to America. Well, his face lit up as if he had just won the lottery. And he said, I'm from America. He said, if you ever get to America, please, if you get to Poughkeepsie, please tell them that George said hi. Well, I had no idea what a Poughkeepsie was, but I told him I would try. Well, from that day onward, we became just the fastest friends. And every single day when I would arrive at the senior center and, you know, I had to take two buses to get there and sometimes I would be a little late. But the minute I walked through those doors, no matter what else was going on, George would cry out at the top of his voice, she came. And, you know, I think that's how the Lord feels when we simply sit in his presence. You know, maybe just pull up a chair and sit in the middle of your room and hear all of heaven cry over you. You came. God welcomes and longs for our presence. 
One of the other things that I began to realize is that a lifetime is not too long to pray. Maybe you're in a situation where you think, you know, I've been praying and praying and praying, and it doesn't seem as if God is answering, so I'm just, I'm just going to quit. Let me tell you about a friend of mine. My mom and my sister, my brother and I, after my father's uh, death, moved back to the little town where mom was originally from. And we went to the small Baptist church where she had gone and her parents went and her grandparents. We'd been in that church for generations. And every Tuesday night, I would go with my mom to the prayer meeting. Now, it was a small church, so there was probably just about maybe 20 of us. But there was one gentleman, Jimmy, who every single Tuesday night prayed for the salvation of his wife. He would pray with tears pouring down his face. I can't tell you how many times I ended up in tears with Jimmy as he prayed for his wife. And I remember asking one night, asking my mom, how long has Jimmy been praying for his wife? And she said, well, probably over 30 years. Well, one day, Jimmy said, um, would you like, he wanted to take my brother Stephen and I, and he had a little private plane, and he wanted to take us to the little island way up in north of Scotland, where he was from. And he said, we might enjoy the little right, plane ride up the west coast and then seeing the little island where he was from. Well, we were absolutely thrilled, so we said yes. And I'll never forget, as we landed on in a field. He had to go around a couple of times to chase the sheep away, but we landed in a field and then made, up, made our way up this little cobbled street to a place where the old church, or Kirk as he called it, was where he used to go and worship. And we, the door was open and so we walked up to the front of the church and you know the, the beautiful old wood creaked and I thought, I wonder how many tears and prayers have been poured out in this place. And we got to the front and sat down in the front pew. And Jimmy was looking up at a picture of, of Christ carrying back the sheep that was lost. And after a little while, I said to him, Jimmy, do you mind if I ask you a question? And he said, no, lass. And I said, do you ever wonder why God hasn't answered your prayer for your wife? And he was quiet and thoughtful for a moment. And then he turned to me and he said, he's never failed me yet, lass. I don't reckon he'll start now. Well, several years passed and I went on to seminary in London. But one Christmas when I was home for a Christmas break, I, I discovered that Jimmy had just passed. And so I was able to go with my mom and my sister, my brother, to his memorial service in our church. And the church was packed with people whose lives had been impacted by the faith of this simple Highlander. But I didn't discover it until later that day that it was at Jimmy's memorial service that his wife gave her life to Christ. When she saw the church packed with people who'd been impacted by her husband, but then heard the message of the Savior Jimmy loved, of the Savior Jimmy followed all his life, all the way home. It was on that day that she gave her life to Christ. Now, he wouldn't know that for another couple of years until she passed and entered into the presence of the Lord. It just reminded me, a lifetime is not too long to pray. Jesus tells a story, I think it's Luke 16, uh, of the persistent widow. And it's interesting the way that Luke describes it. He said, Jesus told this story to let us know that we should never give up praying. You know, the story of the relentless widow who wants to get justice from the judge, but he ignores her. Scripture makes it clear he doesn't care about people and he doesn't care about God. The kind of person that probably some money would need to pass under the table before he'd take your case. But she refused to give up. He would come out of his house in the morning and there she was. He would go for lunch and there she was. He would come out of the restroom and there she was. So we're told eventually because he was so fed up hearing from her, he gave her justice. And Jesus goes on to say, how much more will your heavenly father who loves you be anxious to answer your requests? But at the end of that story, that parable that Jesus told, there's an interesting verse that I didn't notice perhaps the first few hundred times I read it. It says, and when the Son of Man returns to earth, 
how many will he find who have that kind of faith? Jesus equates relentless prayer with faith in him. One of the other sweet things that I discovered, you find it in the Psalms and also in the revelation given to John, is that the chosen fragrance of heaven is the prayers of God's people. In Revelation, it talks about great bowls of incense being held up um, before the Father, and it's the prayers of God's people. Do you know that every time you pray that that fragrance is heaven? God could have chosen church attendance. He could have chosen Bible study. He could have chosen tithing. No, the chosen fragrance of heaven are the prayers of God's people. Some of us um, perhaps haven't known the Lord as long, and maybe you find yourself thinking, well, I don't even know how to find words. Do you know that sometimes the most powerful prayers are really short? In 1992, when I ended up in a psychiatric hospital for a month, I had been in seminary. I had worked with Billy Graham. I'd had the privilege of being the co-host of the 700 Club for five years. But that first night, as I lay on the carpet of that little room in a psych hospital, the only two words I could get out were these, help me. But I have to tell you, I felt the presence of the Lord more intensely in those broken, struggling for words moments than I had in so many of the supposed glory days of the past. I personally believe that one of the most powerful prayers we can ever pray is one word, Jesus. Power in the name of the Lord. When our son Christian was just a little boy, I was invited to come and speak to his first grade class. And his teacher said, would you speak to the students about prayer? And I looked out at all these little faces and thought, Lord, how, what can I share that would stay with them? And I talked to them about one of the most powerful prayers simply being the name of the Lord. And probably in the next two weeks, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks later, I got letters from all the children. I'm sure the teacher said it as a class assignment, let's thank Mrs. Walsh. But one of the letters I kept because it impacted me, impacted me deeply. And it was from a little girl and she said, my mom and dad are getting divorced and sometimes they get angry and sometimes I'm afraid. But now I know I can go into my bedroom and close the door and I can simply pray, Jesus. I don't know where you are right now. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you are afraid of. But I want to remind you of the truth the Psalmist David wrote in Psalm 34 when he was at one of the, most, the darkest moments in his life. He wrote, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will touch their faces. And then he went on in that Psalm to say, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God is close. Find a moment to just get away and sit quietly and hear all of heaven declare over you, you came. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you so much for my brothers and sisters. But Lord, I want to thank you today for the power of prayer. So often, Lord, I thought it would change you, but it's changed me. So I ask right now, Lord, for my brothers and sisters who may be struggling in some area, I ask that your peace would surround them and fill them. I ask for your healing to touch them from the top of their heads to the bottom of their toes. And Lord, I ask that in these days, we would be those who trust you, even when we don't have all the answers, because you are worthy and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, friends.